and welcome to another episode of History Quest. This month we're going to travel just north of McLeod County to check out the murder site of Chief Little Crow, the leader of the Medawa Canton Dakota Sioux. He was also the leader of the Dakota during the Dakota conflict in 1862. It was getting near dusk. The sky was darkening over a clearing near the edge of the big woods. The magnificence of the sunset was fading, and it left mere remnants of daylight streaking into the night. Along the edge of a clearing were two Dakota men, a father and a son. The two had been picking berries and other edibles for hours. While there, the father handed his son his medicine pouch, a symbol of passing of leadership from one generation to the next a symbolic gesture that typically took place near one's death. The passing of the bundle took on extra meaning, however, as the man passing the bundle to his son was none other than Little Crow, leader of the Metawakanton, Dakota. His real name was Teo Ya Te Duta, translated as His Red Nation or His Red People. He was commonly referred to whites as Little Crow. It was a play off his father's name, Hawk That Hunts, which was mistranslated as crow that hunts. He was a perplexed man, one torn between two worlds. He preached harmony with the whites, favored assimilation into their world, yet never abdicated his Dakota values. In 1851 at a gala dinner in Washington, he wore a black frock coat with a velvet collar, yet he painted a blue circle around his eye to symbolize who he represented. In 1862, when members of his own nation pleaded him to lead a war against the whites, he knew it would end in defeat, yet he led anyway, perhaps thinking he would bear the brunt of the retribution taken against the Dakota upon their defeat. The war was brutal. Because of the depredations suffered by the Dakota at the hands of greedy trade merchants and unscrupulous treaties with the United States, the Dakota took up arms against white settlers living in the Minnesota countryside. He warned against killing unarmed white settlers, chiefly women and children, yet hundreds were killed, many in the most grotesque manner possible. By fall of 1862, the bulk of the fighting was over. Many of Little Crow's followers fled west to the lands of the Lakota. Most of those who remained in Minnesota had not taken part in the war, and they had admonished Little Crow for the fate they were sure to suffer. With little left to fight for, Little Crow and his remaining supporters fled Minnesota, hoping to rally support in the north and the west. Upon leaving the state, the once powerful chief looked over his shoulder and took one last longing look at the home of his ancestor and declared that he would probably never return. Little Crow was unsuccessful in finding others to support the war. Most blamed him for the problems they were sure to face because of his actions. Defeated and dejected, Little Crow decided to return to Minnesota. He knew he was a wanted man, knew there was a bounty on his head, and he knew it was only a matter of time before he was found. Yet he was determined to die in his homeland, the land of his father and the land of his ancestors. While picking berries, Little Crow and his son were spied on by another father and son, Nathan and Chauncey Lampson of Hutchinson, Minnesota. The United States placed a bounty of $25 on the scalp of any Dakota found roaming free in Minnesota. The Lampsons could not pass up the opportunity. In 1862, $25 was a lot of money. They killed what they thought was a random Dakota Indian, not knowing it was Little Crow until some time later. The fight was fast. Nathan Lampson braced himself against a tree and fired at the Indian standing in the berry patch. The bullet hit Little Crow in the side, but he did not fall down. Rather, Little Crow swiftly spun around, spotted the assailant, and returned fire. The bullet hit Lampson in the shoulder and he fell to the ground. The younger Lampson then charged Little Crow, who ran to meet the charge. The two fired simultaneously, but Little Crow was struck. As he lay dying in the raspberry patch, his blood soaking the earth, his son placed new moccasins on his feet and wrapped him in a blanket. Holding the once great chief's medicine bundle, the teenage son of Little Crow departed the scene. The body of Little Crow was brought to town, mutilated, put on display, and dismembered. In some ways, the treatment of Little Crow's body was symbolic of the treatment to the people that he once represented, the people who were put on trial, those whose families were separated, and those who were expelled from Minnesota. You could almost say that his name was his destiny, as he, Little Crow, would suffer the same fate as his Red Nation. So I don't know that much about Little Crow, so I'm really interested in this discussion. But what I do know 
Hutchinson had only been a town for about six years before this Dakota conflict really started stirring things up. They had to build a stockade in the middle of town and the entire population moved into that stockade and lived there for about a month. So they were scared, they were cramped, they were dirty most likely, and, he, and the face of the enemy was Little Crow. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, I, th I think people, you know, don't realize it today, but at the time he was almost viewed by whites as we would view a terrorist mm -hmm. today. Um, it, it was very, uh, you know, we, we might look at it today and say, well, that was wrong of people to look at it. But, you know, if you really want to put yourself in the person's shoes from 1862, that's how they were feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why he was so reviled and that's why he was his corpse was treated so badly <clears throat> when they came back into Hutchinson. So how did he become the leader of this re rebellion? It, it's actually, it's, it's kind of a crazy story. Um, so Little Crow's father, the Little Crow, the elder, mm -hmm. he was a leader of the... So Little Crow Sr.? Yeah, or okay. Little Crow Sr. He was, he was the uh, leader of the Dakota, or the Metawakanton Dakota for, for many years. And Little Crow actually just assumed that he was going to walk into a leadership role. Well, when Little Crow was younger, <clears throat> he was actually kind of considered to be what we would call today a punk. He liked to gamble. Um, he drank a little bit. He actually traded whiskey. Uh, he liked to womanize. And he just assumed that he was going to become leader of the Dakota. Well, while his father was on his deathbed, his father, he passed his medicine bundle on to his other son, who was Little Crow's half-brother. And that was symbolic in meaning that his son would take on the role of the leadership of the Dakota. Instead of Little Crow. Instead of Little Crow, correct. And so Little Crow found out about this. At the time, he was living in Lacquaparle with his band. <clears throat> and he found out about this, and he and a group of followers got into their canoe I imagine and they went down the Minnesota River and they came up to Little Crow's half-brother's village and confronted them. Um, they were told, this is Little Crow and his followers, he, they, they were told that they had to leave, they weren't wanted there and um, that they would shoot if they didn't leave and so Little Crow crossed his arms like that and said well then shoot and so they did and the bullet went right between his two wrists like that. Um, they brought him to a white doctor at Fort Snelling, I believe, who said that we're going to have to amputate. That's quite a distance. It is. My goodness. And uh, he, he said that, you know, he would rather die than not have hands because nobody's going to follow a leader who doesn't have hands. Um, which I, I think what he was getting at was kind of like the FDR kind of deal where he had mm. polio and he was in a wheelchair, but they didn't want people to know that because it didn't look strong. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's what he was going at when he was saying nobody's going to follow a leader oh. without hands. And how can you fight and how can you contribute exactly. in that right. time period? Exactly. Um, so what happens was he goes back to a medicine man and the medicine man or shaman, what, ho however you want to term that, he nursed Little Crow back to health and he was able to keep his hands, although his wrists were deformed from then on. Well, the Dakota people saw that as, you know, quote unquote, good medicine, um, saying that, you know, this is the guy we need to follow. You know, in today's term, we would say a religious person would say God wanted him to be a leader. And so they followed Little Crow. So. Did the people in this area, the McLeod County area, know of Little Crow before the Dakota Uprising? Oh, absolutely. He was very famous um, in the uh, white world. Little Crow had <clears throat> gone on many uh, treaty delegations with, uh, with politicians from Minnesota and Washington. He had traveled to Washington on more than one occasion. He, uh, he was very fluent in, in both languages. He could read and write. He went to church. Um, he was actually, I believe he was a Christian. I, I believe, because I know he went to a lot of Episcopalian services. Um, he was, yeah, he had many white friends. Uh, in my hometown, he had a really good friend that he would come to to visit and they would go hunting and they would, you know, he, he, they would share 
dinner. Um, he, he would stay overnight at this person's house when the band would pass through to trade. Um, so he, he was actually very famous uh, in white society. So every, everybody knew of him. And that's part of why it was such a surprise to people when they found out that the uh, Dakota Sioux were basically waging war on white settlers. Almost a sense of betrayal among the settlers, maybe. In a way, in a way. Um, I, I think you could say that. It's a good assessment. Um, I think on the flip side, you know, they, he, he did this because, you oh, know, yeah. he led this because he felt betrayed. Mm -hmm. And actually, he didn't want to lead the war in the first place. Um, what happened was he, Little Crow always preached harmony with the whites. Mm -hmm. And he, he even said on one occasion, you know, don't, basically don't bite the hand that feeds you you know we need their economy in order for us to survive which is why he didn't want to lead the war um, after the murders in Acton where uh, four young Dakota men murdered a uh, family of settlers <clears throat> the the leaders from these four the leaders from that band and all of their followers traveled to Little Crow's village, which was on the Minnesota River on the Lower Sioux Reservation, um, not far from Fairfax and Fort Ridgely. And so they traveled there, and Little Crow was actually, he was living in a square structured house, a white man's house, for lack of a better term. And they came into his room. It was early in the morning. Um, I believe it was even still dark. The sun hadn't even come up. and. All around the house they had, you know, the, these people, these followers were there and they were basically, I mean, almost like in a movie from what I understand where, you know, they, they were playing the drums, they were, you know, chanting, they were ready to go to war. And so this delegation of people who both supported and did not support the war went into Little Crow's house and they woke him up, he, he got out of bed and he, uh, he had soot in his fireplace and he put his hands in there so his hands would be black and he put it on his face which meant that he was in mourning over the deaths of these four um, settlers in, in Acton Township. And they had this long drawn out argument over who should, you know, why what they should, should fight, done. what should be done. Um, the people from the Rice Creek Band who were the, uh, the perpetrators of the murder um, those leaders said, you know, we already have blood on our hands and we should, this, this is the time, this is the time to get our land back. We've been cheated from the government. Um, not all of the whites out there are friendly towards us. Most of them were, but not all of them were, just like today, you know. They said, you know, we've already got blood on our hands, you know, now's, now's the time to do this. Now's the time to drive them out of our land and mm -hmm. get our home back. Little Crow, actually, it, you could quote it from his speech that he gave, is you can't wash away blood with more blood. And that uh, if we go to war with the whites, they're going to send soldiers. And he, he said, you know, this is the Civil War is going on. And he said, you know, right now they're fighting down south and they're so far away you can't hear their guns, was, was what he said. And he said, but we killed one of them and they will band together, turn around and come up and kill us all. And he said, you know, you can, you can count them on your fingers as many times as you can as you see them. And uh, he said, you'll never be able to count how many are coming. There'll be so many. Um, and remember, you know, he had been to Washington. He had been off the frontier. He'd been to the east. He he's, knew. He's seen their power. Yes, he's seen he, their ingenuity. Exactly. He knew. And he also knew that a war with the whites was ridiculous. It was folly. And so anyway, um, I, I forget the year, but at one point they have... Uh, like an election, basically, that the Dakota have for this is the, just the the best way I can think of to explain it, so everybody understands it. They have an election, and they're going to elect a uh, spokesperson, okay. and this spokesperson is kind of their uh, well spokesperson. 
I wouldn't call him the absolute leader of the Dakota or anything this, like that. But, but he's charged with going to the white men and explaining I, their situation yeah, and yeah. trying to work it out? Just, yeah, he's, the, he's, their, he's kind of a go-between. He's their spokesman. And Little Crow... He's their ambassador. There you go. Um, yeah, like a diplomat mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Because um, they're very democratic, you know. They're actually, a lot of our government is modeled the same way that, you know, like the Dakota or other various tribes, nations were modeled. But mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, <clears throat> this different person is elected speaker and Little Crow takes that as a huge loss. He, you know, he feels, that he, he, basically his ego is deflated. He feels that, um, you know, they, they don't want him as leader anymore. And so fast forward to this delegation of war supporters and delegation of anti-war supporters um, are meeting in Little Crow's room and he gives this impassioned speech about why they should not go to war. During his speech, you know, he he says, you know, you don't, you're not listening to me, you don't understand, I've seen, I've been. You know, he, he said, we, we stand no chance. Um, there, there's, you know, what should we do? You're not listening. I've mm -hmm. been, I've seen, and you're not taking my word, and you should be taking my word. Mm -hmm. Not not in an egotistical way that I'm right and you're wrong, as in, you know, I've seen, I've done, you haven't. Trust mm -hmm. me. Um, at the end of the speech, somebody calls him a coward. And he uh, he doesn't take well to that. Mm -hmm. He's you know he says that you know I've I've fought the Ojibwa, I've stood up for you. I'm not a coward. And in a way, when you read his speech, you can almost and, and this speech is very verbatim. His son, who was present, later went on to uh, record what he said. And while he's giving this speech, it's almost like he's convincing himself that maybe I should lead this war. And I kind of th kind of thinking out loud. Exactly, yeah. And I, I think what happens is a he sees that this is his chance to regain not power but influence, mm -hmm. saying that if I don't lead these people, they're never, never, ever, ever going to look at me as a leader again, mm -hmm. and it's going to tarnish his legacy. Yeah. You know, um, we probably wouldn't be talking about him right now had that's he not else. led this exactly. And so maybe that's what he had in mind. You know, he wanted to be that leader again. I think personally, he looked at the situation and said, "Okay, we are going to." go to war, you're going to go to war whether I lead you or not. He knew that. And you're going to get completely slaughtered, slaughtered demolished. And those who didn't go to war are going to pay the price. And I think he knew, which is what happened during the course of the war, which really, you know, the, the main battle, the main fighting, you know, the, with the army and everything, um, the, the scary part of it lasted for about a month. Um, was, was all, and then you know they, they most of them had fled Minnesota by that time. It sounds like he wasn't the most stand-up man in his youth, but he grew into the yeah, leader, yeah, and he took exactly. on this responsibility exactly. of of his forefathers, exactly. and was punished for it. Exactly, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, and and that's where you know today we look at him much much different than. Um, than people did at the, you know, like I said earlier, at the time he was looked at as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And um, we today, if, you know, somebody came in, you know, matter, no matter what their intentions were, you know, mm -hmm. the old adage, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Um, no matter what their intentions were, if they were coming in as the enemy, we're going to view them as the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happened at the time. Yeah. All right, let's go on a history quest. So here we are at the site of Little Crow's murder. Here's the rock 
with a little plaque on it. Um, according to the inscription, it was erected in 1929. He was killed here on July 3rd, 1863. And the event happened, um, according to this, 330 yards that direction. So, 330 feet. or 330 feet, excuse me. So we're looking at approximately the length of a football field from this rock towards those woods. After the shooting, Nathan and Chauncey Lampson traveled nearly 12 miles to Hutchinson and raised the alarm, warning the community that Indians were in the vicinity. The next day, the search party returned to the scene to find an unidentified deceased Dakota man. The body wore a coat belonging to a white settler who had been murdered two days prior named James McGannon. First, the scalp and later the body were brought back to Hutchinson. His body was dragged down the town's main street while firecrackers were placed in his ears and nose. The body was ultimately tossed into a pit at a slaughterhouse and the head was later removed. On July 28, 1863, Wowenape was captured by U.S. Army troops in the vicinity of Devil's Lakes in the Dakota Territory. He informed the troops of Little Crow's death, which prompted exhumation of the body on August 16th. Little Crow's identity was verified by the scars and malformed wrists. The next year, the legislature awarded Nathan Lampson $500 for rendering great service to the state. Chauncey received a $75 bounty for the scalp, although the adjunct general's bounty on Dakota warriors was not declared until July 4, 1863. The Minnesota Historical Society received his scalp in 1868 and his skull in 1896. Other bones were collected throughout the years. In 1871, Little Crow's remains were returned to his grandson for burial. A small stone tablet sits at the roadside of the field where Little Crow was killed. There was a brief little firefight. Um, he, he was initially hit by Nathan Lampson and he spun around almost instantaneously and shot. This is according to a, a Little Crow's son. Turned around and shot and hit Lampson, so you have to imagine the, the swiftness and the marksmanship to be able to do something like that. But, uh, but so Lampson was wounded when they walked the 12 miles back to town. Uh, yeah, yeah, Nathan Lampson would have been wow. wounded. I guess I, I don't know for sure if uh, Nathan, because I know Nathan and Chauncey kind of split up, almost the two of them scattered. I believe uh, Chauncey ran first, thinking that Nathan was possibly dead, and uh, Nathan caught up to him later in okay. town. But they ran the entire way back, or I imagine they ran because they were setting the alarm in Hutchinson that there were Indians in the vicinity and uh, the townspeople came back later. I don't know if it was that night or the next day and they, they took the scalp back to Hutchinson and then they came a day or two later and brought the body back to Hutchinson. Wow. But it's almost, it's just, just being here is, you know, this is the first time I've ever been here and it's, there's a, there's a sense of hollowed ground nest, I, I you agree. know, to the whole thing. It's really, you know, this is just, it's an ordinary field. You see these all over Minnesota. It's just, it's farm and prairie and woods, but just knowing what happened here and knowing who Little Crow was, it, it just adds a level of something. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard, it's hard to describe. And you know, the crazy thing, and this is just, you know, the history nerd that I am, is I think often, you know, what, what events happened in other places that we never know about. This is a, great historic event, I shouldn't say great, but it's a very significant historic event in Minnesota's history, not just McLeod County and mm -hmm. Hutchinson, in the entire state, and even in the entire nation. And so, so we know about this, but what other events like this happened throughout time that have gone unnoticed by history mm -hmm. that might have happened in your backyard where you keep your dog kennel or on somebody else's farm somewhere, you know, we don't know, but it's a, uh, it's definitely, if you're really into history, I mean, you can come out here and just take a look around and really be swallowed up by it. So, what happened to his son? He ran? Little Crow's son? Yeah. Little Crow's son, Wawanape, he, he knew his father was dying. He uh, put a new pair of moccasins on his feet. Uh, he put a blanket over him and he left him. There was nothing more he could do. Uh, he basically, he fled the scene because he knew he couldn't stick around, you know, because he's going to be captured too. He was later captured in North Dakota at Devil's Lake 
uh, by Sibley and his force who was tracking the Dakota through Minnesota or he was following them on a large expedition to you know continue the war and he was caught at Devil's Lake and he told Sibley then that his father was killed you know north of Hutchinson and that's how they knew it was Little Crow that was shot out here. That's so it's almost heartbreaking. It is. And you see the parallels between Little Crow's son and and Chauncey Lampson. Yeah, they really, both they really. both they both ran from the scene. They both didn't know if they'd ever they they probably were thinking that they'd never see their father again. Like it was just an ordinary day for the both of them. And then this extraordinary event happened. In 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 a way too, it's symbolic of the time and the era and what was happening in the United States. You had one one group which was Little Crow and his son who were here and you had Nathan and Chauncey Lampson who were here, one were Dakota whose ancestors had been here for hundreds of years, thousands of years, the other group were white settlers whose ancestors maybe maybe they were the first ones here, maybe their ancestors, maybe they were you know just a second generation, first yeah. generation and one group came in and the other group left. It's so uh, it's it's very symbolic of just you know of of the whole era. Thanks for joining us for another episode of History Quest. Uh, make sure to tune in next month. We're going to go over to Glencoe and we're going to talk about the story of the Hangman's Bridge. So again, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next month on History Quest. Thank you.